My thanks to the AIPM and in particular Siobhan Watt for asking us to make this AIPM Thought Leaders Seminar Tour. Uh, Harvey Mailer and I invite you to take a step back from chaos to appreciate what's known and misunderstood about complexity and how what's required to manage it comes from an, exist an extension of our existing knowledge. Harvey will overview his talk shortly. My presentation has a simple aim. I want to challenge your ideas about projects and project management. And I want to demonstrate to you that in order to begin to address the problems we face with managing complexity in projects, we need to pay attention to the structure of those projects. For my part, I'll quickly overview how we've been taught to ignore complexity and then take you behind complexity to the secret world that creates it, to networks. I'm going, to get, I'm going to get you to turn on that simulation software in your brains and we're going to create a new image of what a project is and what to manage one might be. Look, I have no answers. Um, we're on new frontiers here. Furthermore, what I'm discussing today is undoubtedly only one piece of that puzzle called managing complexity. Nevertheless, I think it's an important piece. And finally, I hope to leave you with a conceptually different way of, inf of forming insightful questions about complex behavior in projects. So, imagine a world with no project managers. Imagine a world where projects manage themselves. <laughs> now, that's a bit inflammatory, isn't it? And I do intend to qualify what I mean by these statements. However, you might think I'm making a statement about some future world, but I'm actually talking about the world today. Over the last 200 years or so, scientific researchers have, in the main, removed themselves from the world at large and entered laboratories to look at small pieces of the world that have been isolated and controlled. And if lab work isn't feasible, then statistical analysis is used to process observations. And this is done to eliminate what's called noise or error from the data. Judging by the tools we see project managers using, the project management world is composed of simple geometric forms, such as triangles, circles and straight lines. The ancient Greek geometer Euclid described the worlds in these forms. Descartes used these forms to develop his Cartesian geometry. And Newton used Cartesian geometry in his great discoveries. Within the scientific community, this way of seeing has become second nature. Newton's legacy is deeply embedded in our education system, which continues to teach us to search for clear patterns and relationships. We have learned not to see the world's richness and complexity. I'm sure the last book you read or talk you attended on project management used similar diagrams to explain project management concepts. We look beneath complexity to find simple, complete geometrical forms. We try to find order under the superficial messiness. Now, for years, engineers have straightened out our messiness. They straighten rivers, level hills, regulate plant growth, and generally pave over things to give our world a Newtonian look. In order to understand certain phenomena, we reduce things to their smallest parts. Well, this works fine if you're trying to understand how a bridge or grandfather clock works, but not so when you're trying to understand human behavior. And if one thing could be said about project management is that it involves a lot of human behavior. We are used to thinking with the hub and spoke network, which offers the leader all control over detail. Every orchestra must have its conductor, right? But this is simply not true. The hundred billion brain cells operating in each of our heads right now has no master conductor cell. Similarly, the 10,000 pacemaker cells that tells the rest of your heart when to beat needs no single cell in charge. And these are just two examples of self-organizing behavior in our own biology. One only has to sit outside this evening to hear the self-organizing behavior of the cicadas and frogs. All of these are examples of a natural phenomena in complex systems called synchronicity. Now, the term self-organizing was used inappropriately among many purveyors of new management techniques uh, since in, in the 80s and is still largely misunderstood today. It does not mean 
that if you put a bunch of people together, they will somehow organize or self-manage themselves in a constructive way. Rather, it means that individuals interact with each other in some sort of complicated way and patterns of behavior will emerge. Now, this is a clip from a film called Starlings on Otmore by Dylan Winter. He's a uh, UK freelance journalist and broadcaster. Now, do not equate complexity with randomness. The word chaos actually refers to the appearance of randomness. Our natural system, including our social system, has a hidden blueprint, a structure beneath it which drives its behavior. These network structures adhere to rigid laws which determine their topology, their structure, and their ability to function. Networks are the fabric or skeletons of complex systems. Networks are present everywhere, and all you need is an eye for seeing them. The internet is probably an obvious one. Top left is a map of the Earth showing the cable connections of the World Wide Web. Bottom right is a, is a somewhat simplified visual representation of how everyone is connected to everyone else. This is the network of the Internet. This visualization, of course, is static, whereas the real Internet is dynamic. Next, with the help of some slides, I want to begin to construct for you, in our heads with that simulation software, a new network image of a project. First, I need to teach you a little bit about networks, and at the same time, you'll pick up a little bit more about complex systems. First to note is the prevalence of so-called scale-free networks. They are almost everywhere. In network science, we say they exhibit power law behavior. More commonly, this might be called nonlinear behavior. Now, most quantities in nature follow a bell curve. An example of this distribution would be the average height of adults in the city. We'd have very few seven or eight foot people, three or four feet individuals would also be rather rare. Power laws suggest that the numerous small events coexist with the very few large ones. So for example, if you were to measure wealth of people in Australia, one would see that this obeyed a power or nonlinear law. A few large events carrying most of the action. And I'll show you more power law networks shortly. When comparing a road map with a flight map, one notices a distinct difference between the networks that are created. On the road map, the cities are the nodes and the motorways are the links. Roughly speaking, each city has the same number of motorway connections. But a flight map is very different. You'll notice hubs. Some airports have enormous amount of flight paths connected to them, while others have very few. The super-connected airports are called hubs, and hubs hold networks together. Hold that thought. So, in these networks, there is no characteristic node, and we must therefore abandon any idea of scale, and that's why we call them scale-free. Most networks such as these found in nature and our social system, including such things as product development, are scale-free networks. Each scale-free network will have several large hubs which fundamentally shape how the network operates. Hubs dominate the structural stability, dynamic behavior, robustness and tolerance of real networks. No matter where we live or what we do, we all tend to know people like ourselves. We are clustered into closed circles. and Clustering is another generic property of a complex system. The reality of our society is that it is constructed by close-knit clusters, so-called small worlds, with weak links that bind these clusters together. But, as we shall see, do not underestimate the strength of the weak links. An intriguing paradox about our social world is that, of course, it is physically big, yet because there's a lot of overlap in our social circles, everyone else is only a few connections away. This small world concept was made popular by the urban myth Six Degrees of Separation. However, let me explain how this myth really works. So imagine a crowd in a stadium. We want to get a message from Phil, who's on one part of the stadium, to Jane, who's on the other. 
The only way is for Phil to pass the message to the person next to him and that person to do the same until the message has been passed around the stadium to Jane. Now this is going to take a very long time for this to happen. So let me simplify what's going on here and begin to create a picture of what this network looks like. Here's Phil and Jane in the stadium and these extra nodes represent the people in between them. Obviously there'd be more in reality. Now, what if, because they're all friends, Phil has Jane's mobile number? Phil can call Jane and they can instantly communicate. But more interestingly, the distance between them has now shrunk as the people next to Phil can talk to the people next to Jane simply by passing the mobile phone around. All of a sudden, a whole group of people in Phil's neighborhood can link to a whole group of people in Jane's in far fewer steps than was possible before this incredibly powerful weak link came into existence. Just a single random link has an enormous effect. Add a few more links and the distance in the stadium has almost disappeared. Those nodes I've colored red represent hubs, the highly connected people. A part of this small world effect is that all of us know someone who's changed a job, moved company, simply moved away. And if we maintain even a loose contact, that still means that through them we can influence their cluster of friends and associates. It's these random connections that bring the whole social world together. Everyone is only a few connections away from everybody else. In my previous example, Phil and Jane were in a crowd at a football game. But this diagram could easily represent the network of a project, where each node represents a different player in the project. Some of the nodes might not even be people, but organizational departments. Once we find out who's connected to whom in the project, we might discover that the project manager is not the only hub, and might not even be the biggest. A three-dimensional view of the project might look something like this. Be aware that thus far I've only spoken about static networks, ones with fixed connections, and I'll talk about dynamic networks shortly. Let's look at the network of a project from another angle. Let's say that understanding projects as networks holds the promise of predicting the future. Now, events are never isolated. They depend on each other and they interact with each other. Let me give you an example using the World Wide Web. We can map the World Wide Web by tracing the links between pages. Anyone can put up a website and link to wherever they like. The expectation is that the structure will be totally random and the distribution of connections would form a bell curve, like the example of the road map I showed you earlier. However, we find that the web links are not evenly spread and they conform to a power law where some web pages have a huge number of links to them. This suggests there's an underlying organizing principle to the structure of the World Wide Web. It has evolved or grown according to some blueprint and we can predict its hub-like structure. The hub networks can be found in our transportation systems, computer chips and within the cell and it turns out that there is a simple law that describes their structure. The law is preferential attachment. Simply put, as a group we follow patterns. Popularity is attractive. Those that get connected to are more likely to be connected to. Now this law nicely demonstrates the peculiar strengths and weaknesses of networks. There are potentially hundreds and thousands of errors in each one of my cells right now and I don't even notice. The internet still works when hundreds of its routers are not functional. If you remove the small nodes, it doesn't matter. The network will shrink, but it will still function. However, there's a price to be paid for this robustness. If you remove the hubs, then the network will fall apart. Networks dominate our economy and our society. We never notice them unless things go wrong. Society has its hubs. There are people who are far more connected than the rest of us, and they allow information and disease to travel far and fast 
along the network. Once we assume that viruses spread randomly, now we know that the viruses spread via the hubs in our social network. The web of sexual relations has grown using the same laws as the World Wide Web. A study of sexual behavior showed that most people have only a few partners, whilst a handful have hundreds. Whether it's a computer virus or a biological one, once it penetrates a hub, it can spread unstoppably through the network. Of course, we can use this information to our advantage and apply the vaccines to the hubs and not randomly vaccinate as we previously did. So more than likely, complex projects have a predictable growth pattern and structure. Perhaps they move in a particular way too. What if we could observe the network of a complex project as it comes to life each morning? This is our national telephone network as it comes to life on an average working day. The activity of every exchange in the country is being tracked second by second. By two o'clock, we're making almost a million calls a minute. Every city is aflame with chatter. Belfast. Glasgow. But in a project, nodes, people or business units, come and go. Two nodes might merge into one, or one role may split into two. In this study, delegates at a workshop in Italy were electronically tagged and in this visual display you can see them turning up in the morning, interacting and moving between the workshop areas, the cafe and the bar. I'd like you to pay attention to the dynamics of this image. As new nodes or new players appear, they change the structure and the dynamic of the network. In this image we can see that each node is somehow, even through its weakest of links, influencing the behavior of others. Each participant influences the project, but none as much as the hubs, whoever they are. You can find more great uh, network visualizations like these on their website, sociopatterns.org. Now, when I watch this, I'm reminded of the flock of birds we saw earlier on. Could the underlying network structure of a complex project behave something like this? When the project is going well, how does the network behave? When the project is encountering troubles, how does the network look then? More interestingly, are we able to identify telltale signs, early warning patterns of behavior that signals trouble ahead? If we know where the hubs are, we can protect them. The networks I've shown you have just highlighted the links between people and not even begun to talk about the integrity of information or data that's being shared across those links. What if one node introduces misleading information? Is that like giving a complex project a virus? We know that the network is robust enough to deal with a few failing or misleading nodes, but we know there are consequences if misleading or viral information is passed to a hub. If we know who or what the hubs are, we can engineer their protection or at least know where to inject the antiviral, where to target the correct information for best effect. By virtue of being a social network, all projects even those who exhibit the most complexity are scale-free small world networks. That is to say that it is a network of clusters that communicate through weak ties and we must protect these as clusters get new information by activating their weak ties. So drawing my part of this talk to a close, let me qualify my inflammatory statements I made at the beginning bearing in mind all that I've said this evening. Though networks are not random, chance and randomness does play a part in their construction. Real networks, like projects, are not static. Real networks are self-organized 
as there is no centralized control, no manager node in the traditional sense. Rather, there's a hierarchy of hubs that keeps the network together and fundamentally shapes and influences the emergent behavior of these projects. They are flexible and tolerant to internal failure. Finally, with this knowledge and understanding of networks, we could begin to engineer complex projects for optimum performance. Hopefully, I've demonstrated to you that when you step back from what looks like chaos, you can now appreciate that there is an underlying and understandable network beneath.